Hi, everybody, and welcome to uh, today's webinar. Uh, and today we're going to be speaking about exponential or exponential organizations. You can actually see the book in the background. And I'm really delighted to have Dr. Clarence Tan with me, who he's uh, our local expert on exponential organizations here on the Gold Coast. And um, Clarence, please introduce yourself. Thank you very much for your time. Ah, thanks, Dion. So I've been the resident of Gold Coast of Australia for the last 25 years. Um, I'm currently still professors at um, adjunct professor at both the universities here, Bonn and Griffith University. And I was the Asia Pacific um, ambassador for Singularity University, which is the think tank at NASA Ames um, Research Park, where we work on using exponential technology to try and solve the grand challenges we face in the world today. And I'll our MTP, which I'll talk a bit more about, our massive transformative purpose for Singularity is to impact a billion people within 10 years positively. That sounds really exciting, just uh, the, the type of people that you hang out with that are creating really world differences that probably many of uh, the audience doesn't even know about. Yeah, um, yeah, we meet people like Steve Wozniak, um, you know, uh, Vinod Kosler, Kosler Venture, the co-founder of Sun Microsystem, Reid Hoffman. Um, yeah, people that you only see on TED Talks. So it's an amazing experience. I highly encourage uh, you know, the viewers to check out Singularity University. Yep, awesome. So I'm going to share the slides. We just have a small slide deck uh, to go with this presentation tonight. And so there, this is an interesting quote uh, with the slide deck that you shared, Clarence. So can you tell us a little bit about this? Yeah, so what we are seeing today is that um, there are so many new technologies that are coming out, um, you know, and, and things are accelerating at such a high speed at an exponential rate as opposed to a linear rate. And our brain is not capable to uh, comprehend some of this technology that's moving so fast and disrupting industries, um, you know, in a very big way. And as you can see, um, a Yale University um, research professor um, basically, you know, predicts that S and P 500 companies, uh, you know, that the lifespan of the company is going to go from 67 years down to 15 years. Um, some of the other examples, I mean, you can see like IBM took like over, you know, 30, 40 years to be, you know, become a billion dollar company. Um, Snapchat took like less than 18 months. Um, so things are accelerating in a very fast pace uh, at an exponential rate. And the problem with exponential curve is that they start very small. So like, you know, 0 0.1, you double it, 0 0.2, mm. you double it, 0 0.4, it's still under one. And then suddenly when it hits one, in less than 30 steps, you'll be a billion. So wow. that's the problem that people don't comprehend. Like, you know, they get this illusion, they say, oh, this technology is, you know, not going anywhere. For example, like 3D printing is not a new technology. It's been around since the 80s. Um, but now we're going to see the, uh, we're actually at the uh, cusp of this exponential curve because um, the main pattern in, exponent in uh, 3D printing has expired. Mm -hmm. And now you're going to see a flux of uh, new 3D printers coming to the marketplace. And it's obviously meant there's many businesses out there that don't think any of this stuff pertains to them because they're not necessarily a tech business or, uh, you know, they, they're really, they only rely on tech for maybe paying things on PayPal or the FPOS machine or, mm -hmm. uh, so how, and we'll talk about this a little bit later on. Um, but you know, just to put it in perspective before we move on is why is this stuff really important, say for restaurants and your traditional brick and mortar businesses? Okay. The restaurant's a good example. Um, so in my talks, so by the way, I'm also the um, exo.works, which is uh, Salim Ismail, the author of uh, Exponential Organization um, Setup. So I'm the exo agent, um, sprint coach, and uh, and a certified consultant for uh, exo in this part of the world. Um, so yeah, one of the talks um, that I do in my talk, I mentioned about a robotic chef called Molly. And this chef, and this is a, it's a robot chef that learned from the master chef in UK, it's a British company. It has over 2,000 recipes now, and it will essentially cook your meal for you. Wow. Um, so when you ask me, like, how would a restaurant owner be disrupted? Well, there's a clear example there, right? Gordon Ramsay can put his app on the robot, and yep. you're going to have Gordon Ramsay's recipe being cooked by the robot according to his instructions. So everybody can have a master chef at yeah. their own restaurant. There you and go. Exactly cuisine. right. Exactly right. And he also wash a dish for you, too. That's it. That's even more important. That's even more important. And, you know, when we talk about um, companies and businesses that have just, that are left behind, the classic story is Kodak. And you shared a, a slide with us here of, you know, it puts it in perspective. Yeah. So, so we uh, term this as the Kodak moment. 
Um, Kodak at its peak had about 135,000 employees globally. Um, and it invented the very um, device that disrupted its whole industry. Mm-hmm. And what happened with Kodak was that it forgot that basically that, um, you know, it's actually now a digital company when they d- developed the uh, camera. They still felt that they were a paper and chemical company, um, which is why they've been totally disrupted. Um, in the old days, when you take a photograph, probably costs about a dollar US, right? You got to buy the film, you got to send it for a few days for it, wait for it to get developed. You got to get the uh, machine to develop it, to get the chemicals, the paper, and so on, right? Today, when you take a photo with a uh, camera uh, on your phone, what's it cost you? Zip. Yeah. And the yeah. whole supply chain in the whole uh, photography industry has been disrupted. So coming back to, again, you know, a small business retailer, if you had uh, in the old days, you know, a photo studio shop that developed photographs, you know, your entire business has been uprooted because it's no longer required because yeah. I can immediately print my photo at home or just watch, see it on my uh, phone and send it to all my friends and share it. And that has also changed, um, you know, uh, the exponential technology has changed the world from a world of scarcity to a world of abundance. Mm. In the old days, right, you know, you, you, know, you go to photograph, uh, you know, you, you go to a photography studio or learn how to take photographs from photography schools because you don't want to, you don't want to waste film and it's too yeah, expensive. Yeah, yeah. Today, right, you know, you, you are taking a mirror of photos from your devices, from your PC, from your phone, from your iPad, you know, you name it. Um, and basically now the problem is finding all those photos, yeah. right? So it's a new problem, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I can totally uh, relate to you being a photographer myself and a sports photographer, you know, you, you knew that you probably didn't get that money shot yet. And That's so right. you're just waiting for that one and, money shot because it's the last picture on the roll. And it costs you a bomb, right? Yeah. You to buy a real roll of film and put, and re- put it, reload it yeah. today. It's nothing, right? You can just buy a memory um, card and stick it in your uh, phone and just continue taking photos, upload it. Yeah, and it also doesn't matter how you frame it because you can just go into Photoshop and then do whatever yeah. you want uh, in, 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 the, in the new computer darkroom, so to speak. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and there's one other thing, though, on the photography side. I mean, you know, as I said, Kodak had about 135,000 employees globally and went bust in 2012, spectacularly, right? Um, and the same year, 2012, Instagram sold to Facebook for a billion dollars. Yeah. How many employees do you think that Instagram had? Twelve. Right. So what I'm trying to say is that, you know, the, I know the government is always trying to find, um, you know, create more jobs and more opportunities to create jobs. Um, but would you rather have a company like Kodak that could be disrupted and totally uprooted and go bust? Or would you rather have an impact company like um, mm. Instagram that's worth a billion dollars? Yeah. Right. And obviously, you know, even even though these companies that are worth a billion dollars have very small footprint of staff, but they create a lot of uh, opportunities for other entrepreneurs. You know, now you've got people who add on uh, photography, um, you know, basically uh, enhancement software on top of Instagram and yeah. you can sell as an app. So, yeah. you know, a lot of other opportunities that come out of it. So mm. I mm. think, you know, the, 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 I think the fantastic thing about the era we're living right now um, is that it's no better time than now to be an entrepreneur. Right? Mm. Because, mm. you know, if you have a great idea and or you want to sell a new product, cost you almost nothing to set up, you know, um, an e-commerce store and, and, and you have 3.85 billion people on the internet right now who yeah. are your future customers, collaborators, and investors. Mm, mm. Um, so in the old days, you had to find a premises, a random premises and, you know, find, you know, and sign up for a corporation mm. certification and all that. Today, you just go on Facebook, go to Shopify, set up your um, shop and then start selling stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, the other thing that um, just came in and out of my head, oh, that's right, when you were talking about um, Instagram, the there's really no reason to reinvent the wheel. You had made that uh, that statement of, you know, you can put apps that, in a sense, uh, latch onto that. So it, it, you can almost use the successful companies such as Instagram and leverage when yeah. you can see how, how can I – actually um assist in that or or grow with it yeah grow with yeah. them yeah so so that's what we do really help you identify trends right what trends are going to grow exponentially how to ride on it uh, for example i mean led lights 10 years ago you would not even imagine using led lights for anything because it's too expensive mm-hmm. but if you could predict that you know in in uh, within 10 years you'll be so cheap that it actually is causing uh, incandescent bulk companies to go bankrupt uh, shutting down the factories, um, then you could imagine yourself creating all kind of LED lighting system that you otherwise would not even think of. Yeah. So it created all these new opportunities. So, um, you know, try to predict what the trends that, that, that are emerging. 
Um, so for example, I mean, I think, um, I think there's a slide that we will probably be looking at all the different exponential technologies. Yes, yes. Yep. Um, um, there we go. Yeah, there yes. you go. So let's touch on the first one, data and AI, right? I mean, the AI. So my background was actually, you know, um, in artificial neural networks. Uh, this is like, I wrote a book like almost 20 years ago um, on applications in finance. But for example, AI, I mean, when I was actually uh, earlier this year at the Berkshire Hathaway AGM, when Warren Buffett was actually asked by one of the shareholders, um, how would AI disrupt his business? As you know, Berkshire Hathaway is one of the most successful companies mm. in the world. Um, and Warren said, you know, well, AI is providing the um, brains for the self-navigation autonomous vehicle, which is safer than humans. It doesn't text, doesn't get drunk. It can see <laughs> 360 degrees around itself, talk to other cars, talk to our know, traffic system, you yep. know, weather system and so on. Um, and that's going to reduce premiums dramatically, mm. right? Mm. So he, you know, and Berkshire Hathaway, one of the biggest shareholding is actually in Geico, which is the uh, big insurance company. Yep. So when insurance premium for cars drop, um, then obviously his revenue is going to drop. But then, you know, the good thing about it is it's going to save more lives. Mm. You know, there's like so mm. many lives are being lost and limbs and people being disabled because of that car accident. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so this is the interesting stuff about, um, you know, what, what's coming. I mean, I'm not sure if you guys have seen the uh, Google Autonomous Vehicle. Uh, it, the, the Google car has got no steering wheel because Google feels that the human is actually the most dangerous yeah. um, you know, element in the car. And they'd probably, probably be attracted to get behind the car anyway, even though it's driverless. That's right. But yeah. it, has, it has side view mirrors. You know? It has yeah. no steering, but it has side view <laughs> mirrors because uh, the US law is a bit quaint there. It doesn't require to have a steering wheel, but a car must have side view mirrors. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. Can you, um, you know, while you're on the AI, can you touch base? What's this big data? Because I know uh, we're starting to see that terminology a fair bit and yeah. businesses have, has, have asked me, what is it? And they don't think it pertains to them. Right. So big data is essentially information, right? That, that is generated through this digital world that we are in right now. So even when we take a photograph, that's actually data, mm. right? Um, I'll give you an example. There's a, um, a speaker at um, Singularity um, who uh, is a professor at Stanford University, uh, Andreas Wagen. He uh, graduated from Stanford and he went to uh, Amazon and became the chief data officer. And then he came back to Stanford. Um, he essentially is looking at how data is used for um, for uh, social in a social uh, um, mechanism for um, tracking people and so on. So what he did was he actually had T-shirts made for his students with a QR code on it. So when you take a photo of a student, it will automatically, if you have a QR code reader on your phone, you will automatically read the QR code, send the photo to him, and tell tell him where his student is. So he's <laughs> tracking them. So it's that's kind of creepy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Legalized stalking your students. I'm not quite sure about that. <laughs> right. So, so, so basically trying to find patterns of, um, you know, that, that might not be obvious, mm. um, you know, and, and um, yeah, a lot of people say that they're using big data, but nobody really, you know, um, seems to actually understand um, the potential that it has. Yeah. Um, it, it's used from any field from medical to retail and so forth. So for example, um, if you were to data mine this big data that you have, you would find that perhaps, you know, uh, men who go and buy diapers also buy beer, you know, mm, in, mm. In, in the USO market where they have liquor stores and they sell liquor in the SO market. So you might want to put nappies next to beers. Yeah. When I when I teach students regarding like digital marketing and, and some of this big data, uh, am I correct when I say to them, you know, if you buy your um, net uh, Nespresso mm -hmm. that uh, that's then can be connected to their data center so they start to actually find out what's your favorite um, blend you know if it's hazelnut and then yeah. so they can almost automatically identify what well, geez you're low on hazelnut uh, chocolate and all yeah. of a sudden I mean I mean you, you, you can see examples like this on Amazon and on Netflix right Netflix is an algorithm that basically data mine what movies you watch and recommend movies that they feel that you would actually like Mm -hmm. um, Amazon actually look at your spending behavior, your shopping behavior, and they start, start suggesting to you, even eBay, right? Start suggesting to you that items that you might actually be interested in but haven't had a chance to look at. Mm -hmm. So really, that's been around for a long time. And I mean, it just yeah. seems like big data is this new trendy word. But when you look at Amazon, they've well, been doing it for a long time to say, well, people who bought this book, 
you know, the exponential, they've also bought abundance and, and other like right. minded books. But you see that that's only data that Amazon has on their own, right? But now you're talking about integrating that data with your, your refrigerator. Yeah. That Amazon didn't used to have. Yeah. But now, you know, the Internet of Things coming, um, you know, they know that, you know, you drink organic milk and you run out of it very frequently. So then Amazon can start planning perhaps a special plan for you. Yeah. Which is another one that, uh, that you know, in a sense, small to medium business would um, need to kind of at least think about or maybe embrace. Um, obviously, I think the digital manufacturing and nanotechnology, which is mainly 3D printing. So if you don't know what 3D printing is, it's what's also known as additive manufacturing because the current manufacturing methodology we have is what's known as subtractive manufacturing. You take a, a block of wood or you take a piece of rock and you start chipping away, right, uh, to get the item that you want. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of wastage. While in 3D printing or additive manufacturing, you're layering essentially mm -hmm. uh, material over one another and create um, products that sometimes can only be done through 3D printing. Yeah. Um, why would that impact um, retailers? Well, um, imagine now, you know, you don't actually have to spend a lot of money buying a lot of uh, things um, that you can actually 3D print in your house. So when I was a keynote speaker for Deloitte um, Global Tax Conference in Bangkok last year, um, they actually brought up an interesting case where um, government are losing revenue uh, despite increasing uh, VAT and GST around the world. Um, and the example they gave us 3D printing, they said in the old days, when you buy a pair of shoes, like a crop, you know, about for a hundred bucks, 55 bucks went to tax, right? Input tax, oh, yeah. you know, VAT, you know, and uh, sales tax and so on, right? But today you can download the entire um, blueprint for the crop shoe from Thingiverse or one of the websites yeah. and 3D print it in your house. Wow. Right? And government loses total revenue from it. Yeah. Right? So yeah. Um, that's an interesting one that I thought, um, you know, is an example of some of the impacts for SMEs. Yeah. You need to look at um, how some of this technology, when it be, you know, when become more um, uh, ubiquitous, yeah. then obviously it's going to have an impact. Uh, I've been fascinated. I've gone to the consumer electronics show for the past five years, mm -hmm. and I remember when they first started having these three D printing. It was quite small, and now it's quite big. And you know, they're printing uh, motorcycle parts on you know Ducati right. bikes, right. and 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 it looks. It looks exactly like, you know, that would have came from the manufacturers. Uh, there you go. So, and, and, and it can be customized and bespoke to, yeah. your, to your exact needs. Yeah. And, so no, it's so. fascinating. It's fascinating. So, and uh, so maybe on the other side, um, uh, what's uh, this blockchain, the digital economy is the cryptocurrency that seems to be making a lot of noise right now. Right. So that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's going to be a big disruptor because at the moment um, you see that um, the banks are the one that are making a lot of money and lawyers and so on, all the intermediaries. So what blockchain technology does is enable um, people to deal directly with one another by providing the uh, trust factor that's missing. At the moment, you need the bank to, you know, to transact for you or your lawyer to transact for you because you don't trust the other party. Um, but with the blockchain or open ledger te technology, um, essentially, um, nobody can actually uh, try and uh, I guess, uh, take advantage of the other party because all the contracts that are done are available publicly. And mm -hmm. essentially, um, yeah, I guess we don't have time to go into the details of it. Um, but, you know, all the cryptocurrency that you see and so on are all um, basically based on the uh, blockchain technology or an open ledger technology yeah. that, that makes everything transparent. So yeah. they're, they're, they are basically creating things like smart contracts, um, an example that I heard um, recently was, uh, I think, in uh, in an Asian country, and a new upstart insurance company that's going to be offering travel insurance um, is going to be using smart contracts. Um, so essentially, what happened is when your flight is delayed, right? Um, everybody mm. knows your flight is delayed because the, the, the data is out there. Yeah, yeah. But the problem is then, you know, you have to go and photocopy your boarding pass, fill up a form, send it in and you get a refund of 200 bucks, like nobody will bother doing it, so nobody will bother buying travel insurance anymore. Mm -hmm. But with this smart contract, you don't even do anything, you just pay for the insurance, they would have all the data about if your plane is delayed, you automatically get paid if your plane yeah. is delayed. So they think that they're gonna basically wow. corner the insurance. So it almost sounds like even though you might be a small medium business or a large business, even if you don't understand the ins and outs of it, because I understand that technology 
I'm still confused about how right. it works. But just to have an appreciation of if I have anything dealing with contracts, then insurance, legal, real yeah. estate, accounting, anybody that deals banking. in that contract banking, yeah. that technology will impact it at some point, That's at right. some point in time. That's right. And I mean, you've seen this uh, recent speculative bubble on the cryptocurrency, um, because at the end of the day, I mean, you know, uh, how does a um, sovereign nation control its economy? It basically forces people to use their currency, right? Mm. Uh, but the problem is, you know, uh, most of this, uh, most of the countries of the world are printing more paper than the actual value that the paper is worth. Mm. Uh, yeah. It's only backing it through. Uh, uh, forcibly through, uh, you know, through laws and rules and so on. But the cryptocurrency is providing an alternative for people to actually use it as a medium of exchange. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. We could go through um, all of these, and, and maybe that's something in the future where we can almost have a, a webinar on each section of it. Oh, of definitely. How, it's a huge. Of how each business, because, you know, the sharing economy, gamification is, yeah, is becoming yeah. a huge thing. Um, I'd like to finish up with our last slide here of um, you know, really an exo organization. And I don't necessarily know if we really defined what an exponential organization right, is. Right, right. So an exponential organization is uh, basically defined as an organization that's growing at 10x or more, 10x, 100x, like Airbnb, like um, you know Uber, like Google, and so on. Not 1x, 2x, 3x, not linearly, but growing exponentially. So 10x, 100x, and uh, you know. Um, and so Salim is found in his book, Exponential Organization, talk about basically underlying a, a company that's growing exponentially, um, you know, is an MTP, which is the massive transformative purpose. What is the purpose of this entity, right? So for example, Google's MTP is organizing the world's information. Mm. It's a huge lofty goal, right? But everybody can understand it regardless of whether you're an investor, you're a customer, you're a stakeholder, you're an employee, and they can rally behind it. Coca-Cola is open happiness. Yeah. Um, you know, singularity is impacting a billion people. The TED, TED movement, the TED talk is ideas worth spreading. Um, so, you know, it's beyond a vision or an objective. Mm. So that's, that's the underlying um, uh, foundation, I guess, for a exponential company. And on top of that, there are 10 attributes. Yeah. So um, on the right-hand side, you see something called um, SCAL, S-C-A-L-E, the acronym stands for Stuff on Demand. So these are, these are external drivers to grow a company exponentially. Okay. So one is obviously, you know, for a company to grow exponentially, you should have stuff on demand. I just mentioned to you Instagram and they had 12 people. Yeah. So you need to outsource as much as you can. Um, therefore, you know, it's creating more jobs for people who want to be their freelancer or entrepreneurs, yeah. right? Um, second one, C stands for community and crowd. You know, do you have a large enough uh uh, customer base mm. and then a is for algorithm and algorithm means uh, using ai and technology to drive your exponential growth for your company yep. so an example is ups ups in america is like you know it's like dhl or uh, federal express uh, essentially it's algorithms make sure that when you deliver a package to your home the cars never have to go against traffic so in america they never have to make a left turn and australia never have to make a, a right turn yeah so you say few you say you know time. yeah 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 and then uh, L stands for leverage assets. So essentially what that means is don't go and buy, you know, um, huge equipment and stuff like that. If you don't have to, you know, use what's out there that's, that's really available. For example, the 3D printers are available in, in, um, in libraries and in makerspace and so on. Mm -hmm. um, Square, the device that goes on the mobile phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the guy floated a company for a billion dollars, but he developed the entire Square uh, casing and packaging from uh, makerspace in San Francisco for a thousand bucks. Wow. wow. Um, and engagement uh, is how do you engage your customers? How do you get them to come back to you um, to, to engage with you? Do you use gamification, get them a badge or how do you encourage them? So that's, that's the external side, right? So the, the engagement almost sounds like the, the old fashioned loyalty programs to a certain extent. Exactly right. Exa yeah. Except maybe a bit more sexy now yeah. with hats and badges and <laughs> yeah. stuff. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's the external side of driving the business exponentially. And then the other side that you need is how do you manage an exponential business? Because mm -hmm. the, the hierarchical business uh, model that we, or business organization that we have right now is kind of uh, 
not able to cope with companies that are growing exponentially. You, you know, you're stuck in meetings of the meetings of the meetings, working on KPIs that you have no idea why you're working on it, except your boss told you to do so. And yeah. you don't know what the big picture is. So that's why people don't have a sense of purpose and then they quit, right? And yeah. they get, go to another job with a higher pay. Um, so that's why we have the uh, ideas um, on the uh, left-hand side here. Yeah. So I stand for interface. How does your customer deal with you? I mean, do they use a platform like iTunes Store so they can go pick and choose what they want or do you have to actually speak to each customer? That's not really scalable and you yeah. have to spend yeah. all your time dealing with each customer. And then these dashboard, you know, basically what that means is how do you measure how well you're doing? Because what you cannot measure, you cannot improve. Yeah. So you've got Google Analytics or, you know, uh, how many face impression you get. Yeah. Yeah. Um, e is experimentation. So that, that means, you know, allowing your staff um, and your people to try new things and mm. fail, and fail quickly and fail fast, right? Because um, we, if you don't let them experiment and try new things, how are they going to be innovative? Yeah. So in this in this framework, um, failing is actually a positive thing. I think in all extent. frameworks for new uh, you know, for, for all the new businesses that you see today, yeah. right? Um, the old days of like a Kodak, you know, spending millions of dollars with the R and D department, the engineering department, and the marketing, and then launch a huge product, and then it might be a flop, and then you go back to the drawing board and it's over. Yeah. Today, yeah. you create a minimum viable product. It might just be a picture, you know, and show somebody, do you, would you buy this if I make this? Yeah. Um, and then if you get some uh, verification, then you go ahead and do it. That's why crowdfunding is an amazing way yeah. of doing it. And and using three D printing, you can. You know, a, just go to a makerspace a, a and, and say, and show show people. Yep. exactly. Yeah. And then A is for autonomy. And that means to empower your staff to basically do the job that you need them to do. And rather than having them meet all these KPIs and going to meetings after meetings and do CYA, right? Cover your ass. Yeah. Right. So, so, you know, you need to provide them. So, you know, that new management style like Holacracy, which uh, uh, Valve that runs Steam, um, you know, and ING Canada uses to mm -hmm. empower their staff to actually care about stuff. And the last one, social, is how do you use social media um, platforms to communicate with your employees and your stakeholders? So, you know, you could use Line or WeChat or WhatsApp or Zoom. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, essentially, that in a nutshell yeah. is what the EXO framework so is. So, does, does a company have to do all of these to be considered an exponential organization? Um, no. That would be a lot of work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, actually, you only need um, four out of these 10, a minimum of four of these attributes yeah. um, to basically uh, put you on a path to growing exponentially. Yeah. And, and I, I guess it'd be one of those things, just take one at a time, as opposed to try to do all four at one time. Yeah, you, just kind you, of you dabble in it. Basically, you know, try and identify areas that you uh, need to improve on. And yeah. then, uh, um, you know, in, in the actual 10-week spring workshop that um, EXO.works does with like Procter & Gamble and Unilever and so on, um, they actually create two groups of uh, participants from the corporations. Um, so one part would be what they call the EXO call. They will be looking at how to use exponential technology to work on existing business, okay. um, knowing that it'll be disrupted down the road. And then they create another group that create what they call EXO on the edge, creating uh, kind of companies that will disrupt the parent company. So they could be working with the competitor and so on. Uh, but essentially, these are the companies that are coming out with new ideas you know, mm. that might actually revolutionize the whole industry. Yeah, wow. Amazing information. And uh, we, just, I, we just put this slide in uh, that I think sums it up, uh, not just with exponential organizations, but the, the way that the world is going. You know, the Internet's been around for quite some time now, yep. and it is our new nervous system. It is. Uh, and um, the mobile devices that keep coming out, and I know that won't go away. Uh, will serve as the edge points and nodes in that network. So I guess for every organization now, they need to really look at where are they positioned on the internet as well as how are they embracing mobile, which we didn't even get a chance to talk about in regards to making sure that their business is there and hopefully to be sustainable in the future. Yeah, as I said, you know, we have 3.85 billion people on the internet today. By 2020, there will be about uh, five to six billion people on the internet. You know, these are all your future partner collaborators and so on. And, you know, it's making the, level, the playing field level across the world, right? Because of $50 smartphone, you have as much information, access to information as uh, anybody else in the world does. Yeah. So you could be, you know, in the middle of a village in Africa or in India, but you have the same access to information as uh, Donald Trump in the White House. Yeah, amazing stuff. Well, we're out of time. And I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Clarence Tan very much for his 
his wisdom and insights of the future. I'm sure that um, I can get Clarence back to discuss even going more in depth with all the various exponential technologies. And um, once again, thank you and have a great night. Thank you.